Welcome to another edition of Marriage for Better for Worse. Hi, I'm Pastor Bob Muller, your host. And for the next 30 minutes, we're going to look at relationship questions and uh, topics that I believe are very relevant at the moment, that are very, uh, very much uh, of our time. But we want to look at them from a timeless perspective, which is God's Word. And so tonight's topic is, what's the hidden cost of living together? What's the hidden cost of living together before marriage or excluding marriage altogether? We'll get to that in just a few minutes. If you'd like to write us with a question, do so at bob at forkeepsministries.com, bob at forkeepsministries.com. Or you can leave a question on a recording device by calling us at the number you see at the bottom of your screen. I'm not a professional counselor or therapist, nor do I have degrees in psychology or psychiatry. No, I'm a pastor that believes caring, listening, prayer, and God's Word um, is God's method of solving relational issues. And uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled this evening to be able to share some of those answers with you. Well, let's start with a question or two. And these are questions that through the years I've been asked or situations I've observed. And the first one is this. My fiancé and I are currently sharing the same house, but we sleep in different bedrooms. Some of our Christian friends are saying we are living in sin, while others are telling us that as long as we stay uh, pure or chaste, what we're doing is just fine. What would the Bible say about our choice to share the same house, though not married? Well, the scriptures do say um, that we are to avoid even the very appearance of evil. And I think appearance is not the same as uh, caring about what kind of car I drive or how I dress or what kind of watch I have or uh, you know iPhone. This appearance is an evaluation uh, that leads to an evaluation of our character. In other words, um, we are to avoid the appearance of anything that would call our character, our values, our faith into question. And that's different from saying I should, you know, I, I have to put on appearances. No, the Bible doesn't teach us. It says really the opinion of others means nothing when it comes to our value to God or, or our priorities. But we should not put a stumbling block in front of other people. Now, when your friends or neighbors see the two of you go into the same house every evening and stay there all night and come out in the morning, they have one assumption. And with good cause, their assumption is uh, this couple is living together. They are engaging in sexual intimacy. They are doing everything a husband and wife would do with each other, except they don't have a marriage certificate. And so people are formulating their opinion about you based on uh, evidence that appears pretty compelling. And that's why the Bible warns us that we are not to give the appearance of evil. You may want to go into a nightclub or a strip club to witness, but you know, coming out of that club uh, night after night, friends would assume you're there for other reasons than just your testimony. Um, we need to be careful. By the way, in that case, I think the best place to witness would probably be on the street as people are leaving and coming rather than um, being indoors in that situation. Well, that aside, let me just say that um, if the two of you are sharing the same house now, and you uh, are engaged to each other, why not get married? What's putting that off? Why delay? You go, well, we aren't financially ready to do that, or we don't have a down payment, or we still have student debt, or whatever. So what? Um, so what? Do you think God can't overcome those obstacles if you're willing to obey him when it comes to something as sacred as marriage? I mean, when Joseph was told that Mary was to become his wife, um, and then later he learned he had to go to Bethlehem to pay taxes, he could have gone, well, I don't have the money to pay the tax, and I'm not really ready yet to take her into my house, and my carpentry business is just getting going. He just obeyed God. And it says immediately he took her and, and made her his wife. He, you know something? 
we can leave the details to God if we're willing to do the main thing that's right. Um, either marry her now, right away, or move out. I've been living with my boyfriend for the last year and, and um, last year or so, and last month he proposed to me. We've set a wedding date for the fall, and when we went to see our pastor and asked him to do the premarital counseling, he said yes, but then he said something that upset both of us. He would not marry us unless we lived apart until the wedding. That seems ridiculous. Since we've been living together for almost 14 months, what difference would a few more months make anyway? We're tempted to just forget the church wedding and go to the justice of the peace. Well, maybe that is your best option, to forget the church wedding, because if you're going to a church, what you're saying is, I am coming uh, to this place which holds sacred beliefs, which holds to the authority of Scripture, which uh, teaches that we are to live as Jesus lived and to be his disciples. That is the purpose of this church. That's why it exists. And therefore, for them to ask us to abide by the principles and the lifestyle that the Word of God asks of people is not ridiculous. It's not tyrannical. It's not uh, out of line. What you don't realize is they're saying to you, if you want a sacred blessing, you must obey or seek the sacred God. And uh, as much as anybody might want to say, oh, sure, I'll do that. It doesn't make any difference. They're trying to say to you, right now, today is the day to begin seeking God's blessing on your life. But you can't experience that if you're living in sin and open rebellion. So let's remove one of the stumbling blocks or hindrances to God being able to bless your marriage and make it all you want it to be. You know, simply because there are rules doesn't mean someone doesn't care about us or doesn't have our best interest in mind or that we won't even benefit from it if we're willing to follow them. Now, rules don't save us, but rules do show us whether or not our heart is towards seeking God or rebelling against him. We're saved by faith in Christ alone, not by works. But it is then our willingness to follow Christ in his word that shows our faith is genuine and that indeed we have been born again. You know what? Let me say this with someone who's been in this uh, business of marrying people almost 40 years or more. If you will separate before the wedding out of respect for God and his servants, the church, you will be blessed. And you will look back on it and say, I am so glad that we did that. Well, let's get to... Uh, this evening's teaching, which is what is the hidden cost of living together. According to some studies, up to 67% or two-thirds or more of couples now choose to live together outside of marriage. The typical pattern of mating today, if we can call it to that, looks something like this. One, couple meets. Two, couple is attracted to one another. Three, couple begins dating. Four, Within a few weeks or months, the couple begins defrauding one another sexually. That means to take things that you're not entitled to. Uh, five, couple then decides to move in together. Six, a year or more later, the couple decides either to break up or get married. Seven, the couple breaks up. Um, if the couple breaks up or gets a divorce, the pattern is repeated again, often much more quickly the next time. In other words, um, if you have lived with someone and then you do break up, the chances are you will get into another relationship and only this time everything I've read will be further accelerated, but often will end in the same disappointment. What is deleted from this progression is the after effects of morally defrauding one another or engaging in premarital sex. In other words, what was left out of this typical pattern today is what happens if you do get married. And I'd like to talk about that. Respected marriage author and expert, John Regeer, who has worked with more than 2,000 couples attempting to restore their marriage during his ministry, has identified a distinct pattern of unintended consequences 
that follow once a couple has engaged in moral defrauding or premarital sex. Um, they are as follows and typically occur in this predictable progression. Um, once a couple has begun defrauding, once they've begun living together, this is typically the progression, sometimes called a taxonomy, something that builds on each other as it progresses. Starts out with guilt, then blame, then conflict enters the relationship, then a rejection of one another, then a loss of sympathy for one another, then a lack of respect for one another, no desire to be together, loss of communication, loss of spiritual interest, financial losses often follow, develop an immoral pattern associating sex and guilt, leading to possible unfaithfulness later in marriage. In other words, because your sexual highs, if you were, illicit sexual uh, satisfaction happened outside of marriage, once you get married, you're more tempted to find it outside of marriage with someone you're not married to than to stay within the marriage. Next, an inability to respond sexually, then immorality in your family, even among your children as they grow up, receiving sexually transmitted diseases, and finally, transferring any past experiences of sexual abuse to our spouse, even though they were not the ones that abused us. That's 17 unintended consequences. Well, not every couple will experience all 17 of these unintended consequences. They will experience a significant number or majority of them producing ongoing significant unresolved tensions in the marriage. In other words, your past is dragged into your present, threatening your future. Now many couples think, well, we got married, so didn't all that get erased? No, it didn't. The impact of what happened defrauding each other until it is resolved through prayer, confession, uh, God's healing is going to continue to negatively impact your relationship. In fact, to resolve these consequences of defrauding, a couple needs to follow the biblical pattern of breaking unhealthy or negative spiritual uh, soul bonds, which developed. They are, number one, confession. Agree with God that what you did was wrong. The timing was wrong. Two, canceling what you did asking God to forgive you and to break the negative soul bonds that you created. Number three, commanding. If there is uh, problems and issues that have conflict, shame, lack of respect, trust, you need to pray and say, in the name of Jesus, I command that these issues now leave our marriage because we are forgiven and because God has restored our purity and um, holiness. Uh, finally, there needs to be consecrating, where you set apart your marriage as um, a gift. The Bible calls it uh, putting it on the altar, if you will, for God as a sacrifice where we serve him and use it to glorify him. For those currently single or in dating relationships, the scripture suggests an alternative, that is a countercultural pattern to your courtship and mating. Let me give you the pattern God would have you follow. Number one, couple meets. Number two, couple is attracted to one another. Number three, couple begins dating. Couple number four, instead of defrauding, within a few weeks or months, the couple begins sharing intimate, emotional, and spiritual information with each other. Not intimate facts about your body, intimate facts about your heart. The couple begins sharing more and more emotional and spiritual intimate information with one another. Five, an emotional and spiritual bond of genuine intimacy begins to develop. Number six, couple is engaged and remains living in moral purity. Number seven, couple marries and for a lifetime enjoys genuine physical, emotional, and spiritual oneness. So I just bring this teaching to a close with this question. Would you, as a young couple dating one another, like to enjoy great sex for six months or 60 years? Uh, follow the cultural pattern, and six months is about as much as I give you. Follow God's pattern, and 60 years 
of joy, fulfillment, uh, is a real possibility. Matthew 1, 18 and verse 25 describes the pattern, if you will, of Mary and Joseph, the people that God chose to be the human parents of Jesus. In Matthew 1, 18, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother was pledged, we might use the word today, engaged, to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, before they had sex, she was found to be with child, children through the Holy Spirit. That is, she was pregnant, but not as the result of sexual immorality, but of the divine work of God, the miracle of the Holy Spirit. But uh, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. But Joseph had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and she gave him the name Jesus. In other words, Mary and Joseph followed the pattern that God laid out for them. Even though it involved a child that was unexpectedly arrived, it wasn't the result of breaking that pattern or engaging in sin. It was just simply a miracle. And because God desired that Mary remain a virgin until Jesus was born, so there would never be any doubt as to the miraculous nature of his conception, Joseph willingly actually abstained from sexual union with her while they were married until after Jesus was born. That's why we can say in our creeds today, Jesus was born of a virgin. Um, a lot of that is due to Joseph and the fact he respected the pattern that God had established and in the unique case of waiting to have sexual intimacy even though married until Jesus was born, um, cemented one of the great, wonderful, blessed doctrines of Christians throughout the ages. And um, because of his obedience, uh, we can say with, with complete certainty that Mary was the biological mother, but he was conceived through the Holy Spirit. Do you see how God blesses us when we follow his pattern of progression towards sexual intimacy rather than the culture? We have time for some more questions. Um, isn't it a good idea to live together to find out whether we are emotionally, spiritually, and sexually compatible with one another before we make a lifelong commitment? I remember in high school, I was in a, a speech class actually, and I got to be friends with a girl. I was not dating her or whatever, but we just became friends. And she was dating someone seriously. They just hung all over each other between every class. They were always together. They were always wrapped up in each other's arms. And we got into a discussion one day uh, about purity and whatever, I don't know. Uh, we were talking about Christianity because I believe her father was a pastor at the time, I think she told me. And we got talking about the need to um, live, live pure lives as God would, and she started crying. And uh, she said to me through her tears that her and her boyfriend were sexually intimate with one another, but she said, but I believe you need to get to know each other in every way to see if you're compatible. And then she started breaking down and really crying. And the bell rang and her boyfriend was waiting outside the door for her and she came crying and he looked at her and said, what is wrong with you? And then she kind of looked back at me and he kind of gave me an angry glance and the two walked away. Do you know why she was crying? Because she knew she was lying to herself. She knew that what she was doing was not leading to a greater knowledge of one another. It was not going to produce a better choice whether they should get married in high school. She knew probably just the opposite was happening, that with their sexual intimacy, their relationship was becoming less and less honest, less and less emotionally and spiritually vulnerable, that they were falling into a pattern just simply of lust or her giving in to try and keep him, she started crying because God told her it just wasn't the truth, what she was telling me. Um, I've never forgotten that conversation. I've never forgotten her tears. 
And that's why in all the years I've been a pastor and people go, but don't we have to get to know each other? I say, yes, you do. And the only way you can get to know each other is to abstain until you get married. Otherwise, you completely fog over the situation and you don't know and don't see who you're actually marrying. My partner and I have been living together for almost 10 years. We now have two children together. Can children be born and raised in a home where the two parents never marry? And won't they turn out to be just as healthy and normal as kids raised in a home where the parents are married? We believe the main thing for our kids is for them to know how much we love each other and love them. What difference does a marriage certificate make anyway? And that's an argument that's being used around the world today, particularly in Europe. I think in Norway, only 20% of people get married now. And 80% live together, and we're sort of headed in that same direction, aren't we? Well, what the children uh, are not learning from you, which they desperately need to know, is commitment. You can say, living together, we're committed to each other. But should one or the other of you walk away, there won't be anything that you've truly broken because you really haven't made any promises. Not at least any binding promises upon one another. Second, your children are going to learn that um, uh, marriage is, is very much uh, an, uh, just simply an option or a choice for some. And as such, will never really enjoy the blessing of God uh, on their lives as they, they wish they would. Uh, your children are also going to learn to live with guilt. I don't care how much you convince yourself that this is fine, there's no problem to it. Something inside, because we live in a moral universe with a moral code that God has literally embedded or programmed into the very cells of our body, there's going to be this sense that um, what I'm doing is wrong, but I really don't care. Do you really want your kids to have that lesson? And what are they to think of their friends who do have two parents who are married? And uh, many of the joys, the certainties, the, the family names and everything that are passed on as a result, uh, don't you think at times they're a little bit envious of that? I think they are, and whether you say it or not, indeed, uh, they should be. Uh, no, I don't think that we can be living um, in transgression to God's laws and raise children to be emotionally, as emotionally and spiritually healthy as they could be. Doesn't mean they don't have some emotional health, but they will not have the degree to which two people living in obedience to God. Malachi chapter 2 says that we are to be one in Christ and to honor our vows. Why? because he was seeking godly offspring. There is a blessing to be had from marriage passed on to our kids that nothing else can do. My boyfriend and I recently recited marriage vows privately to each other. Doesn't that mean we are married in the eyes of God even though we don't have a marriage license? No, you're not married. You just said some words to each other. Why? Because you were not willing to publicly testify to your marriage. You were not willing to make it a, a public record. You were not willing to um, abide by the definition of marriage that both the scriptures and the state have established, which is uh, a binding uh, legal commitment to one another, not just uh, simply saying some words. Um, it's not, uh, words by themselves can mean something or they can mean nothing. But what marriage asks of us are vows, lifelong commitments and promises that are legally binding, that are socially enforced, that are spiritually recognized in the eyes of God. Um, why didn't you actually get married? Why did you have to do it privately? Probably because you don't want to sacrifice something financially or otherwise by actually being married which is another way, and I say this with kindness, of saying you don't trust God. Uh, I won't get married actually because I might lose this pension or this benefit or something. And that's another way of saying I can't trust God to make up the difference if I do what's right and I lose some check that's guaranteed. Um, don't you think God is able to provide that check in another way or even in unintended ways um, that you never had foreseen? 
I was talking uh, to individuals who have made financial sacrifices in order to honor God in his word in some way, and they have told me they've been blessed beyond what they ever could have imagined, that God honored their faith and their sacrifice. I was raised to believe that living together before marriage was wrong. When I was eight years old, I raised my hand at a summer camp to accept Christ as my Savior. Since then, I have considered myself a Christian. I always intended to wait for marriage to have sex, but when my girlfriend suggested we move in together, it just seemed like the right thing to do, and so we did. Uh, Things are going great, and recently I asked her to marry me. My concern is this. What if something were to happen to me, like a car accident, before we get married? Would I still go to heaven, and would li- or would living together keep me out? Well, no, living together won't keep you out. What will keep you out is never having received Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the only sin that will keep us out of heaven. But living together in clear o- disobedience to God, God's word calls into question whether or not you really did become a Christian. You raised your hand. Uh, You made some type of acknowledgement, but did it transform you? Did it lead to you setting apart Christ as Lord? Did it result in you trusting him for uh, uh, your salvation and eternal life? And uh, the book of 1 John says this is how we show that we, we love Jesus or belong to him. We obey his commands. You know, if you're not obeying his commands, which forbids um, sexual sin, I would really take a strong look at whether or not what you did at camp was just a gesture as opposed to a life-changing experience with God. You know something? If we are born again, we desire to do the will of our Heavenly Father. If we are not born again, we desire to do our own will, and we're willing to compromise and live in sin. So your problem is really not living together, It may be that you've never really met Christ as your Savior. Well, let's finish with prayer. Lord, tonight I pray for all those couples who may be living together, that they would see your plan, that they would see you have a blessing for them, that you want to cancel negative soul bonds and give them a bright future. May they submit first to Christ as Lord and then obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember, marriage is for better, for worse, and for keeps.